as I understand it, though you'll, I hope, uh, correct and amplify what I say, Einstein's theory of general relativity is extremely successful as a theory of gravity and the massive, whereas quantum field theory, and more particularly the, the standard model of particle physics, accounts for the other three forces, the strong force, which you've mentioned, and then the weak force and the electromagnetic magnetic force, and uh, the microscopic, but that these two theories are incommensurable. And if this is correct so far, then maybe you could elaborate on why or how they're incommensurable. Well, one of the great successes, you know, qu quantum field theory, um, you know, is, you know, arguably the greatest, um, uh, the, the 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 greatest achievement of um, you know twentieth century physics or maybe physics of all time certainly you know if you count Nobel prizes I don't know what it is at thirty forty something like that but I, and mm -hmm. the many many aspects of it and um, it is the most accurate agreement between theory and experiment in the history of human thought. That is, there are predictions. <laughs> yeah, 14 decimal places. Yeah, the agreement, I mean, it's incredible. And, um, and the, they're, of course, chipping away at the last digits. And, it, you know, to compute the 14th decimal places, you need big supercomputers. And to measure the 14th decimal places, you need giant accelerators. And it just keeps, agree it keeps agreeing. And now, but part of what led to the standard model, um, so there are the quantum field theories are theories which are consistent with um, quantum mechanics, which we can think of as, say, the uncertainty principle. They're consistent with the uncertainty principle. And at the same time, they're consistent with the principle of special relativity, which is that no no disturbance, nothing can go faster than the no message can be sent faster than the speed of light. Now, all of quantum mechanics and the Bohr atom and all that stuff in the early part of the 20th century, great experimental success, of course. Um, those that early part of quantum mechanics was largely developed in the period of a decade or two, and um, but all of that stuff was not consistent w with the the principle of special relativity that nothing can go faster than the speed of light, and making those two things consistent turned out to be very hard. And it also turned out to be, you can't just write down any old theory and make it consistent, but there was an algorithm for, for wetting the two things, which is the subject of, you know, I have a whole row in my office of textbooks on this subject of how you do it. And it's a very detailed thing. And it, obviously, it's got to be detailed if it's going to somehow produce these 14 decimal places. Mm -hmm. And not mm -hmm. any old theory will, will, um, can be made consistent. And um, it worked for the strong interactions. It worked for the and electromagnetic and the weak interactions. And indeed, it this consistency criterion, you know, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't know about the strong and the weak interactions. And it, it, the, the consistency demands of putting together special relativity and quantum mechanics played a key role in um, narrowing down the possible theories. Okay, the first thing... Uh, but even before you have agreement with experiment, you, you need self-consistency. <laughs> that is, you have to be able yeah. to, if you don't have self-consistency, you can't predict what the experiment is going to see. 
And Kelsey's self consistency turns out to be fantastically, you know, our universe is a very weird place. And uh, to find a self consistent theory that, um, that describes our universe is very hard. And that played an important role and it culminated in the standard model. But gravity was left out of the fun. Um, so, uh, it was never understood how to write down a mathematically consistent uh, theory of quantum mechanics and general relativity. And this had two aspects. Well, let, let me say three, three aspects, three, three different ways, undoubtedly related, but three different ways that you could get into trouble. The first is if you just take the uh, if you if you just take the sort of rules that were developed for taking a theory without quantum mechanics and adding the quantum mechanical sauce to it, um, which worked for this for the strong electromagnetic and the weak interactions, um, you you get infinity. So you would, if you took this seriously, you would say that the quantum corrections to the Earth's orbit around the sun are infinite. And we don't care what Newton said because the quantum effects change it by an infinite amount. Okay, that makes no sense. Right? And um, that's the first problem. Pauli no Wolfgang Pauli noted this problem already, already in the 50s uh, of, of the Pauli exclusion principle. One of the one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, and uh, then the second one is um, well. The, the, I guess the second one I would say uh, is came from Stephen Hawking's observation in the seventies about black holes. So. Uh, gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity, known as general relativity, uh, contains black holes in it. And Hawking famously showed that um, those black holes, nothing, a classical black hole by definition is a region of space time where the force of gravity is so strong that nothing can get out of it without going faster than light. Uh, and nothing can go faster than light. Ergo, nothing can get out of a black hole. Now, um, but then quantum mechanically, there's a there's a there's a boundary of the black hole known as the horizon, the region. And quantum mechanically, the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics says that everything is uncertain, and so the horizon necessarily has a quantum nature. And so, you can't be too sure whether or not you're inside the black hole. And so, things that are inside the black hole might get out. And, um, and that, that means that a black hole will slowly lose energy because we have to conserve energy. And if stuff is getting out, the black hole has to be losing energy and getting smaller. And Stephen gave a very you know, spectacularly elegant and simple calculation of what comes out. And he said that it looks like a kind of random radiation, hot radiation at some temperature. And uh, what happens then is that the black hole shrinks and disappears, but, um, but what came out of the black hole is unrelated to what went in. And that's a big problem because in physics, the laws of physics assert. Okay, now, by the way, they don't tell you this, um, but physicists believe firmly and absolutely in some completely outrageous things, it, it, unshakably, it, including myself. Um, and one of them is that if you knew everything that was happening right now, um, we, we, we believe that we're all powerful. If we knew all the laws of physics and we knew everything that was happening right now, 
we would know everything about the future and we could completely reconstruct the past. Not approximately, but if we knew everything and we knew all the laws of physics now, what was going on now, we would get everything in the future and everything in the past. No room for free will, no, you know, it's an absolute thing. Okay, so um, I believe it, I guess, I don't know if I really believe it, but I, it's certainly a useful belief and it's the, 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 the operating principle of, of every physicist is that we can, we're able to describe everything. You know, if, if physics doesn't, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the end of the movie inexorably follows from the beginning. And if this isn't true, if the laws of physics don't determine the future from the past, what does? Well, okay, you know, um, I, I don't know how even how to think about what an answer to that question would be. Um, so I just assume it's true. Um, and but according to Hawking, it wasn't true because it was random. There's some random number generator of what comes out of the black hole and you you didn't know what was going to come out. You also can't run the movie backwards and figure out what was in because it fell into the black hole and dissolved into nothingness. So that's pretty that's pretty scary. Um, and that's okay, so you could you could try to run with what Hawking said and figure out what we're supposed to say about how the universe behaves in the absence of deterministic laws. Um, but people didn't make much progress on that. And for a variety of reasons, uh, including um, uh, insights gained from string theory, most people now think that somewhere there was an error in Hawking's argument and that the past determines the future. But this is obviously a problem in quantum gravity. It's a, it it's an in, looks like an inconsistency coming out of quantum gravity because it's saying that, um, you know, we use black holes and quantum mechanics and we get results that don't don't make any sense. Uh, so, by the way, this might sound like a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's what we all hope for some puzzle like this because. That's where the, these puzzles are, you know, the keys, if you, they, they provide the keys to our next level of understanding about the structure of, of, of the universe. It's certainly been true um, historically. And many people, myself included, suspect that this quantum gravity puzzle, the black hole puzzle, are the thing that is going to, um, you know, help us understand the universe. I mean, it's amazing how much we understand about the universe already. You know, the uncertainty principle, black hole, you know, it's incredible that the human brain could, the human brain could understand all that. Um, and and it's, it's certainly exhilarating um, to be, you know, to be part of that adventure. But um, so we're, you know, we're hopeful that that this problem of quantum gravity will um, will be useful in that regard. And then the third thing problem with quantum gravity, and this one is a little not quite as sharp as the other two, but quantum mechanics tells you that um, uh, everything is subject to the everything that can carry energy is subject to the uncertainty principle. And we now know that space-time, and I guess we've known for a long time, but space-time itself can carry energy. That's gravitational waves. And therefore, space-time is, is uh, subject to the uncertainty principle. And it's very hard to understand what exactly that means. And, right. and, you know, literally when we teach about quantum field theory, uh, we go to the blackboard. That's our framework. You know, we write down the equations. Space-time is the blackboard for our, you know, and it's fixed there. 
and it's a blackboard on which um uh, on which all the particles and fields of nature uh interact and uh but now in in quantum gravity general relativity the blackboard itself is getting fuzzy and joining in the fun and so what is that supposed to mean um what is the what do, what do we get to hang our hats on what's our starting point um if 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 the blackboard is uh, itself part of the circus so um that's what you know these are very conceptually it's conceptually challenging and it's mathematically challenge challenging um There are about a hundred places where we could go into more detail, probably more uh, jitters of microscopic space, for instance. And I'm actually somewhat surprised that you think the sort of Laplacian idea of determinism is really so crazy, or maybe you think it's crazy to maintain in light of quantum indeterminacy. But okay, you've you've sort of alluded to Bekenstein Hawking entropy and that that's some foreshadowing though of what hopefully we'll get to but just as another maybe concrete example of where things break down and since as i just said i know you've done a lot of work in this area how or or why do the singularities uh though maybe there aren't singularities at the center of black holes stand out as something like paradigm cases where we're really left in the lurch because of the incompatibility of QM and general relativity? Um, well, I, I, I don't know that... Um, you know, a singularity per se is I I don't know that that is the heart of the problem. Um, a singularity per se is uh, you know some of the fe uh, the class of there's a classical singularity inside a black hole and um, in principle you might just think that, you know, all, all equations are approximate um, because we don't know all the laws of physics. We, as I was saying a mo main moment ago, we think there are some exact equations, we just don't know what they are. Um, and so it could, a singularity in principle might just be a sign that uh, we're using some approximation to the equations, which which needs to be corrected. We, we need we need to take into account more terms. So that in and of itself is not is not the most serious problem. The more serious problem in quantum mechanics and black holes is the one I said about the the evaporation and determinism. So this seems to be. And importantly, you might ask the question, um, well, maybe there it's because of some approximation we're using. And that's a very important question. Are we getting these seemingly contradictory results um, because we're, our approximation isn't, isn't good enough? And that might be that might be right but hawking did give what seemed to be a very robust argument that our approximation was good enough that that, that was addressed um and you never have to go to to the singularity to um to to derive the contradiction and so the singularity you know it's behind an event horizon we can't we can't see it so Yes, it's an important thing to think about, but its final role is is not uh, is not clear to us now. 
So I'm I'm sort of surprised by this answer, which means that I'm wrong about something, which is totally to be expected. Oh, well, so you maybe, might get, no, no, no. You might get a different answer from somebody else. Uh, that's the great thing well, about. <laughs> can I try to rephrase or expand on my question and see if we find something else? So the the singularity, the black hole is predicted by general relativity, and. It is an extremely massive object, but it's also microscopic. And the notion... Well, the, the issue of a singularity, of course, comes up before quantum mechanics. So classical black holes have the singularity in the middle of them. And um, yeah, this... So there certainly is a question of how we're supposed to think about that singularity. And people are bothered by it to different degrees. Einstein was very bothered by it and uh, thought that black holes didn't exist because the singularity was uh, impossible to actually produce. Um, but yeah, go on. Well, I, I guess another problem, and then getting back to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, my understanding is that one of the reasons that black holes aren't expected to have entropy in the first place is that the measure of disorder is directly connected to the amount of possible microstates of any given configuration. But if a black hole is as small as it is predicted to be, then there's only one possible microstate. So it shouldn't have high disorder at all. And that's another place where the microscopic and the massive really conflict. Right. So there's something, there's something, um, there's a famous phrase due to John Wheeler that black holes have no hair. And this is something right. you get from the Einstein equation. So if you have a bunch of matter that uh, gets drawn together by gravity, it forms a star. You know, there are many, many stars uh, in, the, in the universe, and there are presumably many, many with the same or almost the same mass as our sun. But each one of them is different in myriad different ways. They'll have different chemical composition. So if you zoom in with the microscope, you'll see different atoms moving in different directions. And uh, so they, they, they differ in many, every, every one of them is completely different. Black, a black hole is not like that. Every black hole with a given mass and spin, they can also have spin, is exactly the same as a solution to the Einstein equation. So that is, um, John Wheeler described that by saying black holes have no hair. And since they, they're all exactly the same, not just approximately the same, but like exactly the same. And this can this statement can be made mathematically precise, and there are a number of mathematical theorems around it, uh, which give more heft to this uh, statement. So, if they're all the same, you know, if you want to store information in your computer, you need a bunch of you, you need a bunch of gigabytes, which could chips, which could be flipped up or down, and you could choose flipping this one up, this one down, many different configurations of a computer. That's how you just store different information in it. But how do you store it in a black hole if every black hole is of the same mass is exactly the same? And that um, was in very sharp contradiction to an indirect inference of uh, the work of of Hawking and Bekenstein, uh, that really Hawking, that that black holes uh, 
have a temperature and things with temperature and energy, as we learned back in the 19th century, they have something called entropy, which is just the, uh, they have some gigabytes in them. They have some storage capacity. They have to have many different configurations. You know, if you have like a hot steam in a pot, you know, it's a lot of little water molecules, H2O molecules bouncing around in there. And the heat is related to the fact that they can bounce around in many different ways. That can be made uh, very quantitative. And um, so to have heat, you need a lot of different possible configurations. You need gigabytes. And um, so uh, Hawking's calculation applied that black holes have an entropy, and there's a very precise formula for it. Um, the classical calculations say that they don't have an entropy, so that's that's a puzzle. And that puzzle, I, you were probably about to ask me this, that puzzle was mathematically solved in some cases in a very robust and detailed way using string theory. And so that was kind of a turning point in our in our thinking about black holes. That's what Botha and I did. 